It's Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 4. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, You have heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. And then let's look at Acts, the second chapter, the first verse. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven, and when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered, because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Why, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear them in our own language to which we were born? The next few scriptures gives all the nationalities. Hop down to the end of 11. We hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. You ever wonder what you're saying when you're speaking in tongues? There it is from the scripture. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others were mocking and saying, They are full of sweet wine. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk as you suppose, for they are assemblies of God. But it is, I'm sorry, uh, it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth of my spirit. And they shall prophesy. Lord, thank you for the privilege of living in the unfolded kingdom of God. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being born into the new and better covenant, the one that's not types and shadows and symbols, but the one that's reality, knowing you face to face. And Lord, we look for that day when it comes into final fulfillment, when we will truly look into your eyes and in that instant be changed into your likeness. I thank you, Father, for the promise of the spirit that you place as a deposit and inside of every believer. And I thank you, Lord, that in addition to that, you desire to clothe us with your power. And I welcome you to do that tonight. I ask you, Lord, that you would make this room the easiest place in all of the universe for people to receive from you. I thank you, Father, for everyone that has struggled to receive for years and perhaps even decades to receive tonight so easily and so naturally, for I know precisely that's your will. Pour your spirit out on all flesh tonight, we cry out to you, Lord. Would you say this with me? Spirit of Jesus, I open my life to your ministry. Speak to me and give me the courage to respond. Reveal Jesus to me as the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You can be seated if you like. I want to share with you here in the next few moments some truths about the baptism in the Holy Spirit that, that I believe are essential for us not only to receive, but for those that have already received to understand how to put it to work in their lives. One of the tragedies of the last 40 or 50 years in the full gospel movements, whatever label you put upon them, uh, has been that, again, we're, we receive well, but we're, we're poor at giving away what God has entrusted to us. Which reminds me of a very scary parable in the scripture, and that's the parable of the talents. This one should make you get the cold sweats and put you into the fetal position at night when you wake up and, and are scared. Because the Bible shows us that people that were entrusted with, with uh, things from the Lord that didn't do anything with them. You know where I'm going with this? The Bible says to the servant, 
that didn't do anything with what God had entrusted to him, the master had entrusted to him, that he was called a wicked servant and that he was cast into outer darkness where there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. How many of you get an idea what Jesus was talking about there? That's a parable that sends shivers down my spine and it goes in right in concept with a lot of what Jesus taught. We understand that to whom much is given, much is what? Required. God requires us to do something about the precious gift that he has entrusted to us. And, and there are some of you perhaps that your next door neighbors wonder where you vanished off to so dressed up on Sunday morning. They think they must have an early country club dance for the last 20 years. There, we have a responsibility. We've got to tell them that it's true now that Jesus Christ is Lord. Because in that day, it's going to be too late. There's, there's a purpose behind the investment of power in our lives. And for those of you that have already received, I hope tonight that God will help rewire our circuit boards to understand that the baptism isn't just something for me, but it's something through me. That's exactly what God reveals to us in the book of Acts. I want to share with you this evening the what and the how of the Holy Spirit baptism. We'll take a look for a few moments at the what, what it's all about, what it will do for me, what it's meant to accomplish in my life. And then the how, how to receive, how to accept this beautiful gift from God. And let me just preface the how part before we get there. And that is, take a deep breath. Everyone in this room tonight can receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit for the very first time. And everyone in this room tonight can receive a refilling from God. You know why? God can't wait to fill us with his power. Why? Read beyond Acts 2 and you find that when people began to connect in their brains that this power is not just for me, but it's through me. Powerful things begin to take place. I mean, the day of Pentecost alone is a great example. All of a sudden, 3,000 people born into the kingdom. Can you imagine if even just one person in this church would grab a hold of the connection of power that's there and take it to its fullest potential? Your church would grow by 3,000 in one day. It would be a real problem. Some of you would be sitting in your seat next Sunday. <laughs> Let's take a look at the what this evening relating to the Holy Spirit baptism. Well, if I were to ask you, what are your greatest spiritual needs in life? What would you say? I'm talking spiritual needs. Because we all know that there's not much that a million dollars tax-free cash wouldn't solve, along with, oh, an island hideaway in Tahiti and perhaps a bunch of TJ Cinnamons fresh out of the oven. I'm just, I'm having this baked goods problem right now. But what are your greatest spiritual needs? What are some of the things that would come to mind? Per perhaps you would say something like, boy, I wish my prayer life had more punch or had, had more zeal in it. You know, zeal is something you have to really watch. You have to, a candle can blow out very easily. We have to let, watch that, maintain that very carefully. Or, or I, I wish when I read the word, I understood it more. I wish when I, you know, when I prayed for miracles to take place, they would. I'm scared to death because I don't think they will. Or I, I wish that... Uh, you know, I had more courage when I prayed, or when I talked with people about Jesus, when I prayed with them. I, I wish that there was just more spiritual passion and fervor in my life. I mean, these are some of the generalized answers. Basically, any spiritual need you have in life can be put into one of two categories. The first one being that we desire greater spiritual intimacy with God. We desire to know Him more. I love the songs you sang tonight. It just fits so powerfully, Pastor Ron, with, with where the Lord's directing us tonight, about God being our friend. I mean, this is a powerful concept if you get a hold of it. Not some distant God like that old hymn of the church says from a distance. Not something like that. But instead, the intimate, powerful God living within us. Some of you need to check your hymnals. That's not in there. But we say we desire greater spiritual intimacy with God. That's one broad category. And then the second broad category of which both of these span all the gamut of our potential spiritual needs is that we desire greater spiritual power from God. So greater spiritual intimacy with God greater spiritual power from God. It's incredible to me that Jesus in just two half sentences described more powerfully and completely precisely what the baptism in the Holy Spirit is all about than anyone else in history. I mean, he knew what he was talking about for he is the baptizer of the Holy Spirit. There have been many volumes written on it and no one has more aptly and, and capably and thoroughly explained exactly what the baptism in the Holy Spirit is about than Jesus. And we find those two sentences in Acts chapter 1, if you'll look there with me. The first half sentence there we find is in, in verse 5 of Acts 1, and this one deals directly with our desire for greater spiritual intimacy. What is the baptism in the Holy Spirit? What will it do in my life? Well, Jesus said this, verse 5, For John baptized with water, 
but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. This half sentence here, Jesus describes the concept of our need for greater spiritual intimacy. I mean, what's baptism? Is that just where you get your hair publicly wet? Is that what baptism is? Upon your confession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, now baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, dunk. I mean, is that what it's, what it's all about? Baptism, we know, is symbolic of our death to the old, our life to the new. It symbolizes that we've died with Christ and likewise live. Paul said it this way, Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ and no longer live. How many know that takes the pressure off when you're dead, right? Now the life that I live is through faith in the Son of God who loved, loved me and gave himself for me. So it's a new life, a life of faith in the Lord rather than a life of dependence in our own identity. We get a new last name. It's a good thing. So when we look at this idea of, of, of uh, baptism, what does baptize mean? Does it mean high humidity levels? Does it mean slightly dampened? Does it mean you're in the yard with the sprinklers on? What does it mean? Baptism means totally immersed, totally drenched, totally literally submerged is probably one of the, one of the best clear understandings of what baptism is. Matter of fact, uh, if you look at some of the uh, Greek texts written around the time of the Bible, the first century, uh, New Testament, you'll find that a lot of times that word baptizo in the Greek is used in nautical logs, ship logs, talking about ships that were sunk or sunken, perhaps, if you're an English teacher. And these ships were literally baptized in the water. They were totally immersed, drenched, sunken in. Now, who was he speaking this to? He was speaking to that, that group of Christians that probably about 500 or so we estimate from what Matthew tells us before the ascension of Christ that he was dealing with, probably the best educated guests we have. Among them were the disciples, the 11, because Matthias hadn't been chosen to replace Judas. And, uh, you know, all these people that the entourage of the close followers of Jesus, plus probably some fringe people. I mean, this was just a, a small group of ordinary people just like us, right? Eleven apostles with a capital A and everyone else was ordinary folks. And Jesus said to them, and by the way, we only know that there was one Levite apostle, right? Matthias the tax, or uh, Matthew the tax collector, right? So he was the only one that had any sort of, I mean, even in a far shot, priestly qualification because he was a Levite. The rest of them were ordinary Joes. They were Galileans. They were country folks, you know. They were like people from Eureka or something like that, you know. And uh, anyone from Eureka? I'm so sorry. But you can't ever win. There's just no way. So Jesus looked at this bunch of ordinary folks and he said, the same way John immersed you in the water, I'm going to take every last one of you. And although the high priest can only minister before the ark one time of year and better make sure the protocol's right or else God will judge him in death, right? I'm not going to let you just stand in the Holy of Holies and gaze upon the mercy seat. I'm going to baptize you between the wings of the cherubim in an intimate moment of being immersed in God. Who is the Holy Spirit? But he's God himself. Jesus said the same way John dunked you in water. I'm going to drench you in the Holy Spirit. How does that sound? Thank you, Lord, and make it a double, right? I mean, we're hungry for this. This is, this is what we long for, to know God face to face. You know, you turn on the Christian TV and you hear all these grandiose stories of people getting beamed up to the mothership and having great visions of God. And you sit there and say, man, boy, that's great. I wish, you know, I think one time I kind of felt goosebumps when we were saying he touched me. I guess that's my big experience. But God has designed for every believer to have an intimate encounter personally with him. Look what happened in Acts 2. It was fulfilled. This greater spiritual intimacy took place. This is something that God just revealed to me a few weeks ago that really helped me. Verse 2, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. What uh, sense do you perceive noise with? Your sense of what? Hearing, your ears, your sense of hearing. Now, when you jump in the deep end of the pool, do your ears get wet? Unless you're wearing one of those goofy rubber swim cap things, you know. All of a sudden, they began to perceive God sounds. You see, the Holy Spirit baptism changes our perception of life because we're getting immersed in God. Our senses are getting immersed in God. Look at the next verse. And there appear to them tongues as a fire distributing themselves. What sense do you perceive visual apparitions with? Well, it's your sense of sight. They began to not only hear God's sounds, but they began to see God's sights. And look at the next part of the verse. And 
they rested upon each one of them. This is significant to me because the way we would like it in our context, you know, we're Americans and we like things nice and nice and orderly and controllable and all this kind of stuff. We like it our way, you know, 30 minutes less or it's free, all those kind of things. The Bible doesn't say that God sent down, like the old hymn says, a great ball of fire right in the middle of them. And they just all stepped into, you know, goodness gracious, that also just step right into. That's not what he's talking about. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that every one of them, God sent down fire that separated and came to rest individually upon them. Now, there were 120 in the, on the day of Pentecost. They're gathering together. We understand from Acts chapter 1. So how, what percentage, and, and by the way, in Acts chapter 1, they picked the new guy through Holy Lotto, right? Uh, so what percentage, trick question for you, the tithers will have this one easy, but what percentage of 120 is 12? 10. See, all the tithers knew that right away. Um, that's 10%. So there was only 10% of the people that received on the day of Pentecost that were apostles with a capital A. Again, we like to think about God operating in hierarchies and favoritism, although we know he really doesn't. The rest of them were ordinary people. There was Mary Magdalene, who had, had, had experienced powerful exorcism in her life and deliverance. I mean, there was Lazarus, who had been raised from the dead. There was Mary, the mother of Jesus. And, and, and likewise, many other followers were there, perhaps even Simon the leper, at whose house uh, she had broken the alabaster box and, and the whole house was filled with the fragrance. I mean, there were all these Jesus cronies that were there, of which I'm proud to be one. And every last one of them, a flame of fire separated and came to rest upon each one of them. God has a flame of fire for you tonight. Greater spiritual intimacy, a personal encounter with God. I'm not talking about standing distantly and having some Old Testament metered out by a priest relationship, some arm's length thing. I'm talking about God letting you pass between the wings of the cherubim, not just splashing around the water's edge, but doing a cannonball in the deep end, immersed in God. The baptism in the Holy Spirit brings greater spiritual intimacy. Let's take a look at the second part of this what. The baptism in the Holy Spirit brings greater spiritual power. I said there were two sentences that Jesus used, or sentence fragments really, the first, the end of Acts 1-5, and the, the second, Acts 1-8, Jesus said what? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not just for greater spiritual intimacy with God. It's for greater spiritual power from God. Now, again, this is where we, a lot of us have made mistakes. If you received the baptism many years ago and you've not been a contagious on fire soul winner since then, the second part you really need to listen to. Because this is, this is the problem. We've raised up a generation of dysfunctional Pentecostals and Charismatics because we've taught them that it's a prayer language. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is not a prayer language. That's a small component of it. It's the first thing that happens, no problem. But it's probably the smallest dimension of what the baptism in the Holy Spirit is all about. Not smallest, even perhaps in importance. I, I'm not qualified to make that call. Only God is. But really, the fullness of the baptism in the Holy Spirit is what is evidenced later on in Acts chapter 2 when suddenly Peter had the courage to stand up and speak. You look at Acts and you find out that there is a distinct posture that the recipients had when they received. What was their posture when they received? The wind blew into the house where they were what? Sitting. They happen to be sitting down at that moment. Now, I've seen people receive sitting down, standing up, uh, kneeling, laying down on the floor, nose down, nose up. I mean, I've even seen one guy in a church that we're actually going back to later on this next year in, in 05 uh, that did, Rochelle, remember, he did handsprings. I've never seen, he was anointed gymnastically at that moment. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, we see truckloads of people baptized, been on the road full time for 11 years in this capacity. And I've seen a lot of people feel that's the only gymnastic baptism I've ever seen before. A lot of extenuating circumstances there, but God, God, uh, I guess, I don't know. I think they turned the defibrillator up to like 200 that morning for him. Hey, Gabriel, crank it up. This guy needs extra juice, you know. But uh, there, there was a, I've seen people receive in all different postures. The Bible helps us to see something that many people look at as an insignificant detail. But this text is so rich and powerful. Every word God's put there for a purpose. Do you believe that? And the Bible says they were sitting. Look what happens then after they've received, after they've had this intimate encounter with God where the onlookers thought they were drunk. I mean, when's the last time you enjoyed God so much that they had to call you a designated driver? You know, 
I mean, they, they enjoy God so much, so overwhelmed with His goodness. I mean, doesn't that stir spiritual hunger in your heart? To know that you can have an encounter with God, whether or not you've been filled and refilled a hundred times. God has more for you tonight. He wants to put an investment of power in you for a purpose. The Bible says, look with me at verse 14 of chapter 2. After they had received, after they had been misunderstood because they were having so much fun. Because that first part of the baptism is just for you. But the second part is for someone else. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them. You see, many people do have not done yet what Peter did on the day of Pentecost. They receive, but they never change their posture. They remain seated. The Bible says that Peter stood up and opened his mouth. This goes to the issue of tongues itself here. A lot of people have a hard time with tongues. The language of the Spirit. Oh, it's so silly. I don't know what I'm saying. Well, let me just be honest with you. You take away all the spiritual context for a moment. Speaking in the language of the Spirit is really strange to the natural mind. It doesn't make sense. Sometimes you even feel foolish because it doesn't. you don't know what you're saying. That's just the rules. God made them and you can't change them. I mean, he's God and, you know, that's just the way it is. The language of the Spirit is something powerful. We, we have for many years in, in trying to minister and teach in the baptism of the Holy Spirit as, as a full gospel, Pentecostal, charismatic, whatever you label it, movement, we've just tried to get people to come up and speak in tongues. But that's not the fullness of what the baptism in the Holy Spirit is about. Now, the Bible is really clear. When you receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit, if you receive the real thing, you'll receive it just like the apostles did. You'll have the same evidence, the same proof. In every detailed account in Scripture, Acts 2, Acts 10, and Acts 19, when they received, and their details are recorded, what happened, how they responded, they all began to speak in other tongues. And the other two accounts, though there's no details, it mentions in passing, it infers that indeed that's probably what happened there in those cases as well. Now, is that to say that we should look for tongues, tongues, tongues? Well, yeah, we look for that, but it's not the end point. Really, to me, the main point about tongues is this. What did Peter, Peter say when he stood up and addressed the crowd? What did he say to them? He said, why are you shocked at this? This is what happens when spirit smothers flesh. You begin to speak inspired words. In the last days, God says, I'll pour my spirit out on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. They'll have supernatural revelation even on my servants both men and women I'll pour out my spirit and they will forth speak prophecy means forth speaking from God their communication will be changed you see when when the spirit of God came upon them they began to hear God's sounds they begin to see God's sights the Bible says they were all filled they began to feel God feelings and then they began to speak God words it affected every part of their being. It affected every part of their communication. It affected every part of the input into their life. You see, here's the bottom line. Tongues, to me, is more than just initial first evidence, which I believe firmly from Scripture. But tongues, to me, is confidence. Because if I can trust God to lead me to speak in a language in which I do not understand, how much easier is it for me when I'm at the 7-Eleven, can I trust God to lead me to minister to someone in a language that I do understand? It's a proof to me that there's a new connection between God's hard drive and my lips. It's proof to me that I can speak God-inspired words whenever God desires me to. And I share this principle because I believe it's so important. All you have to do once you're filled with the Holy Spirit, if you want to blow wide open, if you want to add an extra barn warehouse on your life to store anointing, I mean, if you want an increase of God's anointing, how many want an increase of God's anointing in your life? If you want an increase of God's anointing in your life, all you have to do is this. Leave this room, get around someone that doesn't know Jesus, and just start talking to them. And as you're talking to them, maybe small talk, chit chat, begin to say, Lord, I'm trusting you now to begin to inspire my words. I want to teach you something that, that has changed my life. Here it is. I call it the suspicion principle. We need to get suspicious of the Holy Spirit. Say suspicious, that sounds, yeah, exactly, precisely, suspicious. Every time I feel the Holy Spirit coming upon me, I say, thank you, Lord. But what does this require of me now? What are you anointing me for? You know, sometimes God really, you know, sometimes he hits it with double voltage. And you say, wow, this is an extra charge. What's this for? It's not just so, praise God, we had a great service. I mean, when I was growing up in church, we always, you know, we had, 
you know, thoroughly Pentecostal services. And you hadn't had church until every last woman. This is the day before waterproof mascara. We all went to Denny's afterwards or whatever. And all the women looked like the Lone Ranger, you know, because they'd rub their eyes. The guys all had bedhead and carpet lint in their hair. And their three-piece polyester leisure suits were up like this. And their ties were pulled to the side, you know. I would stagger in there and the Denny said, oh, I guess the bar's last call is over. Oh, no, we're just Pentecostal, you know. <laughs> kind of sounds like Acts 2, doesn't it? We're not drunk, it's just God. God did this to us. Yeah, sure. Sometimes the services were so good, you know, you run out of paper products. The pastor would get in the microphone and say, please, folks, we're going to have to close. We've run out of Kleenex. We've run out of Charmin. Everything's gone. You have to go home and get your own paper products. You had a great service at the Zamboni, the carpets afterwards, you know. You just a... Really good at receiving. Hallelujah. That's great. I love services like that. But what's it for? Is it just, I mean, there's a guy, this is terrible, but there's a guy that came up to me probably about a year ago, ministering in Illinois. He came up to me and he said, open up the back of his Bible. You know, I have those blank pages in there. You know what they're for, don't you? That's for you to write the date of major spiritual events and what it is in your life. You were saved, write it down what date it is. Baptized the Spirit, God did a miracle. Because when tough times come, you can open up the Bible and see how it's been fulfilled in your life. It's just a beautiful thing there. But he, he had a little mis misunderstanding for those blank pages. He had a bunch of tick marks there. He said, you see that? I said, yeah, what is that? He said, that's how many times I've been slain in the Spirit. Tonight I'm going for 29. I said, brother, I'll give you a shove right now. You can have as many as you want, you know. <laughs> I've been in services before where I received more from the minister than I did from the Lord, you know. Some time ago, I was, I was in a service and I was in the congregation. It was a conference. And, and at the end, they asked people to come for prayer. I'm hungry for the Lord. And at the altar, um, I just felt God was just working beautifully in my life. And all of a sudden, I felt this palm on my head. I thought, well, thank God someone's praying with me. Wonderful. I received ministry easy. But the palm just got heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier. And it got to be the point where it was all I could do to maintain my balance. And I opened up and looked. And there was the minister, the conference speaker, they're praying. And, and, and uh, I looked behind me. And kind of when it did, it kind of hand, hand kind of went like this and messed up my glasses. And I looked behind me. And there was a guy with his hand on my shoulders. And he was pulling me back, too. And... And I stopped and, you know, I've become very courageous. I would never normally do this, but I stopped and, and I grabbed his hand to kind of steady me, you know, and I pulled myself back up and I looked at him and I said, brother, I love and appreciate your ministry, but you're really distracting me. I was really receiving from God before you started pushing on me. And he quickly left and, you know, went to the next person. And I was the only one that didn't fall over. That's not to say I must be spiritually belligerent or something like that. But the point of it is not what seemingly happens in the moment, the point of it is what you do with what God does in your life. You know, I mean, we look at this temporary experience oriented stuff and experience is good. I mean, that's the first part of what the baptism in the Holy Spirit is all about. But the fullness of it is what do you do with it? Do you bury the talent in the field or do you invest it and, and bring forth return in the Father's kingdom? You know, when we begin to speak in the language of the Spirit, that's a powerful sign to us. I mean, I don't know about you, but I can talk to anybody about anything. But when it comes to talking to them about Jesus, all of a sudden, my shirts begin to get a little wet around the armpit area. My palms begin a little sweaty and begin to get a little concerned, a little fearful. And I've been filled with the Holy Spirit. You know what I do in those moments? I begin to pray in the Spirit with my brother and say, okay, that connection's still there. All right, I'm safe. You know, every morning in my devotions, when, when I get up, I always pray in the Spirit in the shower, just kind of my... My thing I've done for years and years, it's a great place. The acoustics are wonderful, you know. It feels like you're in St. Peter's Cathedral or something like that, Basilica, when you're praying in the Spirit. And uh, praying in the Spirit in the shower. And, and every morning, I, I, when I try to shut the water off, I say, Lord, thank you so much that, that you have empowered my speech to speak your words. And I not only give you the, the unknown tongue, but I give you my English too, Lord. That's a sign to us. A sign to us. Greater spiritual power. But we must choose to change our posture. Here's what I said about being suspicious about the Holy Spirit. Let me give you the rule of thumb. Whenever you're one-on-one -on -one with an unbeliever, it's a God moment. It's a God moment. It may be their only chance to know. That doesn't mean you need to carry around a 65-pound Dake Bible and smash them over the head and say, you're going to hell, you lousy critter. You know, it, but it's your opportunity at that moment to open up your mouth and begin to talk. I mean, all ministry flows out of a relationship. Begin to be a friend. 
and I begin to talk with people. I've discovered that in, in our you know, recent societal changes in America, the last decade or so, people have become less and less and less and less friendly. And even, we'll go to churches a lot of times. I can say this because your church wasn't like this. At least our experience this morning. I mean, you might all be rude and just putting on the dog for us. I don't know. But you're, you appear very friendly to us. I mean, very, I mean, that's, that's a major part of, of conjuring up a culture of belonging. And the same thing, when, when you begin to build relationships with people, you'll find as you begin to develop friendships with them, that as, just in your normal course of the day, that God will just put things in your heart to share. He, you know, a lot of times we think of evangelism as has, having to close a deal in 15 seconds or less because it might be your only shot. But we forget that many times God just moves people towards him a little bit at a time. Whichever way that happens, we need to be sensitive to that. And if you're full of the Holy Spirit, he'll give you the right words at the right time. I shared this principle with a, a lady we were ministering in Pennsburg, Pennsylvania, which is near Allentown, uh, Pennsylvania, maybe what was last spring, something like that. Yeah, last spring. And at the end of the morning service, many people came forward and received the baptism. Sunday night, we get this testimony at, at the healing service we had Sunday night. A lot of people have been healed and they were lining up and giving their testimonies. It was a powerful moment. And this lady comes forward and she says, well, I have more of a testimony from this morning. Well, kind of for tonight, too. She said, well, my husband and I are visiting from a church. Um, we, we moved in town here. We haven't found a church yet. And though we are, have been, always been taught that full gospel people are loony, that speaking of tongues is from the devil, we decided because you're the closest church to our house that to come here. We came this morning. And she said, I looked at my husband during the middle of the message and said, you know what? We're believers. It's not like if we go up, we're going to get a demon, you know, so because we are full of the Holy, you know, Holy Spirit lives in us. We're his temple. So I know we're safe for that. And I, this has really stirred my heart this morning. Let's go up and just open up our hearts. And he was a little, you know, reticent to do so. But they both came forward and they both very easily and, and quite accidentally received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. She testified about that. She said it was so beautiful. She said, I couldn't believe. She said it was well, the moment I began to speak in that other language, although it was strange to me because I've never done it before. She said it felt like I had always been filled with the spirit because it felt so right. She said it was like going back to an old familiar place. The sense of rightness just overwhelmed me. And she said it was God giving me the confidence. And, and I was share with people after they received. Now, great. You've got the confidence. You can speak God words now. So when you get around an unbeliever, open up your mouth and start talking to them. Begin to trust God to guide your speech. Stand up and open up your mouth. Change your posture. Open up your mouth. Begin to speak. Right? She said, well, this morning after church, my husband and I both received. We drive out of the parking lot, hang a right onto the street and uh, left onto our street. We're going down about a mile. We see this Dodge Caravan with the blinkers, hazard lights on the shoulder. I looked at my husband. He looked at me. And we both said at the same time, already? We pulled over behind the car. I got out. He got out. We walked up and there was a single mom in there just in frantic tears. Her car with the radiator was boiling over. She had five screaming kids in the back and didn't know what to do. And, and my husband said, you know, I've got a friend that has a tow truck. I'll, you know, I'll take care of it. And she's, she got in the car with me and I drove her and her kids home about 20 minutes away. She said, I just began to talk to her. And, and she said something that, that floored me. She said, you know, some of the stuff I told her was so good, I went home and wrote it down. <laughs> Some of you know what that's all about, don't you? You know it doesn't come from you. I said, well, I'll remember that. And she said, before we even pulled in the driveway, the mother and the oldest daughter had prayed with me to give their lives to Christ. It just happened so easily. We've got to change our perception. We look at lost people as these... You know, dirty, rotten sinners that, you know, oh, God, come and rapture us out of here. But God says, well, I would if you just do what I want you to do now. God is willing that how many should perish? None. So when we start doing our job, that's when the spirit and the bride begin to say, come, Lord Jesus. The Holy Spirit's all about convicting and empowering people to, to witness to someone who has that conviction stirring in their life. That's when the spirit will say, come, Lord Jesus. But the bride says, come, Lord Jesus, like Revelation talks about, when we begin to enter in and begin to tell other people about the Lord. You know, there's every altar call that's ever given in every church around the world will never win the world to Jesus. The world will only be won to Jesus through personal evangelism. This is where the baptism in the Holy Spirit is so important. She went on to say tonight in the healing service, she said, you know, we got in prayer groups and she said, began to pray one for another and, and she starts crying and the, there was a lady that came running up the platform with her and a, a little boy and she just, the other lady grabbed the microphone, I'll get it, she grabbed the microphone and she said, uh, 
She starts crying. She said, my son, he's seven years old here. He was born cross-eyed. He's had seven surgeries unsuccessfully to fix his crossed eyes. So the doctor said they can't do anything more. And she said his, his uh, I think it was a right eye. Anyway, one of his eyes was so crossed, it was literally buried into his nose. You could only see the outer edge of the iris. And she said, tonight, we got in our prayer group and she said, this lady here, I don't even know her, but she said she started speaking in tongues and just gently laid her hand on his shoulder. And I watched. I saw the eyes straighten out, and it's perfect. And the boy leans over and says in the microphone, everybody, I don't see funny anymore. I mean, the whole place erupts in tears, and I thank God that some people in that room understood that the baptism isn't just greater spiritual intimacy with God, of which I'm highly thankful for, but it's for greater spiritual power from God if you choose to stand up and do something about it. Second part's the how, and we'll be done here in just a moment, because it's already like midnight my lands are so late uh, the baptism in the Holy Spirit the second part is the how how do you receive well I've got great news from you you can't receive from God without his help now you can try and you can try decades but this is a divine partnership with God there's two extremes a lot of people think that you need to do all this stuff to receive from God you know, and there's books and formulas written, you just do this, you know, you stand on one foot while wearing a garlic necklace, reciting the 23rd Psalm in the original Hebrew, and you'll get what you need. I mean, it's just all this formalized junk. And that's trying to do it all by yourself. People come to the altar, oh, Lord, if you'll just fill me with your spirit, I'll do this, 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 and this. I won't do this. I won't kick the dog anymore. I won't, you know, cuss whenever I hit my thumb with a hammer anymore. I won't do this, Lord, if you'll just fill me. Does that sound like trying to exchange spiritual things for, with works from God? How many know that doesn't work? It's by grace we've been saved through faith, and that not of ourselves is a gift from God, not a reward for works. And everything works in God's kingdom by faith, not works. Now, faith inspires works, but the works don't garner us anything except for the naturally expected obedience that faith brings. So when you come to the altars tonight to receive for the first time or a refilling, please don't make the mistake of trying to receive yourself. Many people come, and I, I, I pray with a lady in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, um, back, it was early in the fall, and she told me before I prayed, she said, I'm a tough case. I said, all right, how's that, you know, you have metal plate in your head or something like that? Can't, you know, well, how's that work? It's amazing what you say under the anointing, you know. It turned out not to be a word of knowledge, just insulting. But uh, she, she said, no, I've been trying to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit for 51 years. I said, you are a tough case, right? I said, well, I'm going to tell you something. Whatever you've done for the last 51 years, don't do today. She said, what do you mean? I said, you're not going to seek today. Today is a day to receive. See, a lot of people will get all bent out of shape. They say, Lord, if it's your will to fill me, fill me right now. Jesus, or Peter said, rather, Acts 2, 38 and 39, that it was God's plan to do it right now, if you'll just believe. If you're born again and made of skin, right? Made of flesh? How many made of flesh? I'm a little overqualified right around here. If you're born again and made of skin, then you are instantly qualified to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. People say, I'm not worthy enough. Well, of course you're not. People say, I'm not holy enough. Of course you're not. I'm not spiritual enough. Of course you're not. But receiving now will make you more spiritual. Receiving now will help you become more holy. I mean, after all, He is the Holy Spirit. You know, I mean, we look at things so funny, cart before the horse. I said to her, here's all I want you to do this morning. You can ask, you're allowed to ask God one time. But beyond that, I want you just to get as close to Jesus as you can. Because after all, only Jesus can baptize people in the Holy Spirit. John said, I baptize in water, but there's one coming after me who's greater than me. He will baptize you in the Holy Ghost and fire. Again, that Jesus looked at that in Acts 1.5. So I said, you have to, really, if you want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you have to get as close to Jesus as you can. And I held up, they had a glass of water there on the pulpit. And the pastor had uh, partaken of his water to the very bottom earlier. So I had a full glass and empty glass. I just put them out at arm's length. And I said, watch this. And I clanked them together. I was actually scared I was going to break them, but I didn't. Clanked them together. And you know what happened? Just like this. You know what happened? Any physics majors out there? Anybody know anything about inertia? Some of that full glass hopped over into the empty glass. I said, that's all you have to do. You're the empty glass. He's the full glass. Just collide with Jesus. It will be so easy. She starts crying and she said, I never thought about it being that easy. I said, why don't you start loving him? Oh, you're allowed to ask him once. 
She didn't even get a chance to ask him. She said, oh, Jesus. And all of a sudden, out gushed the language of the Spirit. We've got to not do it by ourselves. But then the other side of that is people say, oh, God, come and do it to me. They think it's all God. Oh, God, come and get me. You know, there are people that will drive 25 miles to church, but then they won't take three more steps to get in the altar for God to do something deep in their lives. And this close enough mentality, this arm's length, I've punched my card, I've paid my dues mentality, robs people of spiritual transformation. God, come and get me. They think waiting on God is like you're in some doctor's office. You fill out your clipboard and gave it to the nurse. She's walked it back there in her orthopedic shoes and support hose and handed it to God and said, all of a sudden, about 20 years later, she peeks around the corner and says, Jones, it's your turn. That's not waiting on God. Tearing is a beautiful thing, but tearing doesn't mean I'm just laying around waiting. There's an active pursuit involved there. There's divine cooperation. The key to understanding the Holy Spirit's work in our life in every realm, transcendent principle, is cooperating with Him. God does something, you do something. You do something together. That's exactly what happens. Here's the final thought underneath this how. The Bible gives us a pattern of how to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Very, very clear in all the detailed texts. Act two, Acts 2 at Pentecost, Acts 10 in Samaria, Acts 19 in Ephesus. Here are the three steps. Number one, the seekers were began actively pursuing Jesus. We learn from Luke 24 that they continued daily in the temple, praising, worshiping, praying, seeking the Lord. Learn that also from Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 10, they wanted to hear more about Jesus, you know, the vision of the sheep with all the creepy crawlies and all that. How many thank God for Acts 10? How many like to eat a red lobster? No red lobster without Acts 10. Right? Hmm. Yes. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Amen. Right? They were, began to pursue Jesus. Acts 19. The same thing in Ephesus. They began to pursue Jesus. Step one. Get as close to Jesus as you can because no one can fill you with the Holy Spirit but Jesus. As a matter of fact, the prayer I tell people that perhaps they may want to consider praying is, Jesus, would you reveal yourself to me as the baptizer in the Holy Spirit? The baptism in the Spirit isn't just something that Jesus does. It's a part and parcel of who he is. You get to know him more because that's part of who he is. That's a pretty good thing. So begin to collide with Jesus. Just run towards him. Ask him once or twice. Don't try to cut any deals. You know, a lot of people feel like they, they step to the altar they become Raymond Burr, you know. They've, oh, now... Great judge of the heavens, let me plead this case before you. That's not the way it works. You don't have to convince God. He's already convinced. You've already missed enough opportunities by living a powerless Christian life. You know, he wants to fill you now so you can tell everybody you know. Second step is, the first one is something we do. We, God won't do it for you. Your praying grandmother can't do it for you. You must choose. Step forward and begin to get as close to Jesus as you can. And I triple dog dare you to praise the Lord the way you make fun of other people for doing it. Right? Well, I don't raise my hands because, you know, that's too undignified. Well, then you have a false sense of dignity. What is dignity anyway? It's a euphemism for pride. Think about that. Who set the rules of dignity? You did. You ever been wrong before? Only all the time, right? So, I mean, we, we have such faulty perceptions. Oh, God, come and do whatever you want to do in my life. As long as it doesn't make me look stupid or make me look like her. Right? So we begin to pursue Jesus. That's something we do. We, God won't do that for us. No one else. You've got to do it. You've got to step out of the box of dignity. Lift up your hands. Lift up your voice. Press in. I mean, some of you only lifted your hand this high before. Remember the first time you lifted your hands? All of you know this if you've done it before. Begin to swat flies when you get busted, you know? <laughs> Pursue Jesus. The second step is something that you don't do, but something that God does. Again, it's just co cooperation, partnership idea. We press in. God won't make us do that. But then the second part is the Holy Spirit comes upon us. This is the next step in all these detailed accounts. Now, I wish we could make that happen. I wish I had a Holy Spirit panic button I could push, and all of a sudden, he just come upon me whenever I need it, because I just, like, duct tape that thing down. 
But the Holy Spirit will come upon us. This is different. The Greek verb epi is used there. Everyone who's born again has the Holy Spirit living within them. But Jesus said he would clothe us with power from on high. That would be an upon. It, it's an external power suit. He pours upon us. When you get baptized in the water, unless you have your, or, or jump in the pool, unless you're not pinching your nose or have your mouth open, the water stays on the outside. Get baptized, immersed, but it's external. It, sometimes, you know, God's already done the work inside. Now he does something from the outside in. He rubs it in, you know, on the outside. Holy Spirit comes upon us. You say, what will that be like? Will I roll around and froth at the mouth? Well, if you're rolling around and frothing at the mouth type, perhaps. I mean, I've seen people receive with great expulsions of emotion. And I've seen people that I wanted to go up and put a mirror underneath their nose and they're receiving and make sure they're still fogging it. There's one lady in western Pennsylvania, I'll never forget, she received. And, and uh, I didn't think she received. There's a whole group of people. I noticed her during the service because she sat very straight and very rigid and took notes in a little palm pilot, you know, the whole way through and had, you know, her hair up with a pencil stuck through the, you know, bun in the back that she had in her hair and, you know, horn rim glasses and, and uh, she like an executive, you know, type thing. And at the end of the service, she came forward with all the others. The Holy Spirit came down in powerful ways. And I just kind of kept my eye there because I thought, you know, I wonder, she might be like the first robot I've ever met because she had just no expression. Even at shaken shook her hand earlier during the service in the middle of the, you know, the shake hands time and her hand was cold. <laughs> Makes you wonder, doesn't it? And after the service, I, I went to her at the altar. I was asking everyone, have you received? I went to her and I said, have you received? And she said very robotically, yes, I did. And it was extraordinary. Just, I mean, that monotone. I thought, Wow. You know, I mean, but there are some people that are wired that way emotionally. And some people are afraid to open up to God because they're afraid God's going to come and do something freakish to them. Well, I mean, he could if he want to because he's God, but he doesn't. You know, we see rare exception, unless you're living in gross rebellion, like the Apostle Paul was in Acts 9. You know, then he has liberty to pop scales in your eyes and knock you off your donkey. I mean, he can do that if he wants to. But he does that to people that are in gross rebellion. So if, if you love the Lord... The rule is, anybody ever get knocked off their donkey? Yeah? The rest of us need it. But the rule is that God does what we permit Him to do. He's a God that operates. He's not, God's not a Calvinist. Though a lot of people are. God's not. He doesn't push you into doing something or make you. We're not pawns in His chessboard. He's a God that gives us the opportunity that we must choose to make. First part, we pursue Jesus. Second part, the Holy Spirit comes upon us. How will you know that? Simple, easy way. You will suddenly be aware that the presence of the Holy Spirit is upon you like it wasn't just a split second before. That simple. Then the third step, the first one we do by ourselves. The second one, God initiates by him, himself. But the third one, we partner together. It's kind of like a tennis match. The third one, we partner together with God to do. The Bible says in those detailed accounts that they began to speak the Spirit's words. Who spoke? They spoke. A lot of people think when God fills you with the Holy Spirit that He will make you speak in tongues, that suddenly he, he becomes like Jim Henson and begins to puppeteer you like Kermit the Frog. It's not the way it works. You begin to speak. You must choose to speak. But you begin to speak in a new language. People say, well, what in the world am I supposed to say? Well, the good news is you don't have to worry about what you're going to say. That part's up to God. It's just up to you to speak. But people still say, because we're so control-oriented, but, but, but what? How will I know what I'm supposed to speak? The moment the Holy Spirit comes upon you, open up your mouth, begin to speak. But what am I supposed to say? Well, the Bible says they begin to speak in other tongues. So that means don't speak words you know. But what am I going to say? When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, that's your cue. It's a safe moment to trust God. Open up your mouth. Let go of known language. I tell people all the time, absolutely refuse to speak out the language you know. If you speak English, you speak Spanish, you speak Swahili, let that go. Don't even say, people try to fudge and say, hallelujah. Boy, you know what that means, right? Let go of that. It's a cop out. That's like saying, I'm going to jump out of the plane, but I'm going to hang on to the handle and pull myself back in, right? You've got to take that risk. Open up your mouth and begin to speak. But then again, we panic. But what am I going to say? If you can trust God enough to open up your mouth and not know what you're going to say, God, and that moment, see, the Holy Spirit's already come upon you. That confidence is there. You can take to the bank. He's going to prompt you with new words. A gentleman 
we were ministering in, in Philadelphia this past fall. And at the end of a service, God had just be baptized, just a slew of people in the Holy Spirit. And I was going down the line again, making sure everyone had received, asking them. And one guy said to him, a sharp young black guy said to him, have you received? And he said, well, yes. I said, all right. And then I, I walked a person away to ask the next person. And I came back to him. I said, you seemed a little hesitant. He said, well, when I was down here praying around the altars, he said, uh, a lady came over and leaned over. And, and I didn't see her face, but she whispered in my ear. She said, in just a minute, God's going to fill you with his Holy Spirit. In just a minute, I want you to begin to repeat after me. And so I did. He said, I'm, you know, I'm, I've only been born again for a couple of weeks. So she said, he said, uh, when she began to pray, say those words, I just said what she said. And he said, I mean, I thought, boy, is that all it is? And she leaned over and she said, are you speaking those words I told you? And he said, yes. She said, well, if, if you, you have received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and if anyone asks you if you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, you are to tell them yes. Yikes. You know, I mean, uh, you know, I said, oh. You kind of feel that that's a little strange, don't you? He said, yeah. I said, I'll show you exactly why. And I opened up the Bible to Acts chapter 2, verse 4, where it says they were all filled and began to speak as the Spirit prompted them, as the Spirit gave them the utterance. You see, I, I looked at him. I said, you know why you felt that's wrong? I said, you're only a new Christian, but God already helped you to know that something was up there. I said, you know, it wasn't God that was giving you the words. It was this pushy woman, you know. He said, oh, I said, you got a minute? He said, yeah. So we were right in the aisle. We just began to pray, and God just gloriously filled him with the Holy Spirit. I told the pastor about that over lunch. He said, I know right who she is, and we're getting ready to raise the guillotine blade at church, you know. And he, he starts crying. His wife was crying when I was telling him this because they said, you know who he is? He came to one of our productions because one of his students was dancing in one of their productions they had. He said, he's the head choreographer for MTV. You know. The reason why I share that is because we panic. What am I going to say? And some people even panic to the point to totally rob the supernatural element out and tell someone else what to say. It's the Holy Spirit that prompts us. But you'll never know what the Holy Spirit is prompting you to say until you remove what you would normally say. Because your brain wants to remain in control. They begin to speak in other tongues. Open up your mouth and give God. Push some air out and let the other tongues out. You're still going to panic. What in the world am I going to say? That's the natural brain kind of trying to comprehend the supernatural mystery. Can't do it. Our four-year-old son. How many have four-year-olds? How many parents have kids? It's a growing phenomenon. Um, our four-year-old son is just, I mean, he is such a character. Do you have any kids that were born with Starbucks in their veins? That's our four-year-old. No joke. Every night when we put him to bed, he's just bouncing around on the bed. That's the way he is. He's just... Like this, and then when he goes to sleep, he's bouncing all of a sudden, and then he wakes up in the morning. I mean, sits up violently, and hops out of bed and runs through and tries to wake everybody up. I mean, that's just the way he is. He's either on or off, and he does it all with full force. And he can't tie his shoes. Now we travel. Uh, we have an RV that we travel in because we always have our family together, except for this week, uh, right? Uh, and and so I put him up on the counter, and he can't tie his shoes, so I'll tie his shoes there on the counter. I'll take a step back, extend my arms to him, and he always jumps. And a lot of times now he jumps before I ever extend my arms to him. And that explains the bruises right about here. Just leaps into my arms because I have trained our boys that daddy catches his kids. I don't say, aha. Now, son, today in your homeschool lesson, we're going to learn about the law of gravity. I mean, of course not. I mean, that's my son. I, I'm not going to do anything to harm him. You hear about all these lunatic people hurting their kids, and you, you want to go and minister to their neck. I mean, it just it's so foreign to do anything like that to harm those little critters, you know? And, and so when I extend my arms to him, my kids know when Daddy does this that he catches his kids. He can take that risk and jump out, and I'll catch him. Jesus painted the same picture in Luke 11. He says, how many of you fathers, if your son asked you for a fish, you'd give him a viper? Here, Joey, this is called a king cobra. <laughs> See if you can get his neck to flare out. It's really cool. I mean, you'd never in a million years think of doing something like that, would you? And then Jesus went on to say, if you gave him an egg, or if you asked for an egg, would you give him a scorpion? I mean, the answer is easily, of course not. 
Jesus then went on to say in verse 13, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more, say that with me, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the gift of the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? That means you're not jumping out of the dark and maybe or maybe not God will catch you. When you begin to pursue Jesus as the baptizer and the Holy Spirit and the confidence of God comes upon you as the Holy Spirit comes and begins to rest upon you, open up your mouth, let go of the known language and the other tongues will begin to spring forth out of your heart if you'll just take the risk of faith and open up and speak. That's the leap. There, there's a moment of faith in receiving the baptism and the Spirit that many times people that have stayed and stayed and stayed for years and have not received have been unwilling to take. They're afraid it's just going to be them. Well, it better be you speaking. If someone else's voice comes out, then we break out the garlic necklace, right? <laughs> but it's your voice. You begin to speak. The miracle isn't that you're speaking. It's the content of what you're speaking. And it's your confidence that now, as Joel prophesied, spirit is now on your flesh. And now you have been empowered to speak God words. Would you stand with me tonight? Father, thank you for allowing us to be born again. What a great privilege it is, O oh Lord. Hallelujah. Father, I pray this evening. Oh, Jesus. I feel your wonderful spirit here. I welcome you, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. 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 This evening, Father, I ask you to baptize everyone and refill everyone else. Thank you, Lord. I'm kind of a no baloney guy, and, and uh, you know, there's a lot of device that you can use to get people to respond, but to me, it's kind of cut and dry. The Lord laid in my heart for the first year of ministry that all I was ever called to do was to set the table and read the menu. And then anyone that was hungry would come if they wanted to eat. That's kind of the way that, that we've operated because, I, you know, people persuading people, I mean, that's sales. But the Holy Spirit persuading people, now that's ministry. And uh, I believe tonight that every last one of us in this room could handle a fresh dose of the Holy Spirit's power and presence in their life. There are many that have never received. God wants to fill you for the first time. There are many that have received, but they've never changed their posture and stood up and began to declare. Tonight's your night to receive that suspicious moment from God when He comes upon you. And all of a sudden, your suspicion begins to grow and you say, Lord, this is powerful. Thank you, Lord, for anointing me. I'm not sure what it's for, but I'm going to be ready this time because I'm going to stand up and speak tomorrow. I'm, I know you're preparing me. You're loading my ammunition in, Lord. God has something powerful for us. Some of you spiritually, you've never been able to eke out even near where you need to be. And it's because you only look at the Holy Spirit as, you know, some vase or mipper, vase or mipper, mist or vapor. As Willy Wonka would say, strike that, reverse it, right? But you, you look at it as some, you look at him as some strange, you know, force. But tonight you're going to encounter him as God himself. And Jesus is going to immerse you in his Holy Spirit. There's going to be a flame of fire that comes to rest on your head. You're going to hear God's sounds and see God's sights and be totally filled in your mortal body. And you'll begin to speak God words. There's a transformation coming for you tonight. But it all begins with that first step. What will you do about it? There's some that sit around and they say, I just get blessed watching other people receive. And that's why they just get blessed watching their neighbors go to hell. Sit back. If you want to receive from God, now I serve the ball to you, and it's your chance to do something about it. Tonight, if you want more of the Holy Spirit's power in your life, whether it's to receive for the very first time or refilling, I now open up these altars and say, if you want it, come and get it. Ring in the dinner bell. Come and be filled or refilled tonight. Would you come? Of mercy and grace, thou art welcome in this place Holy Spirit Holy Spirit Thou art welcome in this place Holy Spirit Thou art welcome in this place